morning, depending on where you are joining the webinar. Welcome to LM News special lecture series on international business. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California, and also the director of the Center for International Business Education, often called CYBE or CYBER using the acronym. This program is funded by the grant awarded by the U.S. Department of Education. LMU is one of the 15 schools in the country who are the recipients of prestigious cyber award. The LMU cyber serves as regional as well as national resources to students, faculty, and business practitioners by connecting the workforce and technological needs of the U.S. business community with international education, foreign language training, and research capacities. As part of our mission to help improve global competitiveness of the U.S. companies and industries, LMU Side has been offering special lecture series on international business topics related to trade and investment. Today, we have invited one of the top scholars on global supply chain management, Professor Tobias Schoenherr. I think that no other topics has received more attention from both academia and business world than supply chain management or risk management since the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. Before I introduce Dr. Schoenherr, I'd like to ask Dr. Dale Smith, the Dean of College of Business Administration, to say a few words to welcome everyone. Dr. Smith. Thanks, Professor Pack, and it's great to have so many people here in our Zoom room for tonight's very special uh, talk. On behalf of the College of Business Administration at LMU, we are so thrilled to welcome everyone and deeply honored to have Professor Schoenhar, which is truly one of the top experts in the area of global supply chain management, a topic so very important as Professor Peck has shared when we're talking about uh, the COVID crisis and the post-pandemic recovery. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to turn this over to uh, welcome our guest speaker and um, engage in a conversation about a management strategy so critical to what we do as business leaders and in a future generation of business leaders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith, uh, for your welcome remarks. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Tobias Schoenherr, the Hopeland Metzler Endowed Professor of Purchasing and Supply Management at Michigan State University. He's an internationally renowned and award-winning scholar and teacher focusing on the area of sourcing with a particular interest in buyer supplier relationships. He has published more than 60 papers in peer reviewed top academic journals. His research excellence has been recognized by numerous awards and fellowships. Dr. Schoenherr is the co-editor in chief for International Journal of Operations and Product Management and an associate editor for the Journal of Operations Management Decision Sciences, and the Journal of Purchasing and Supply Management. He holds a PhD degree in Operations Management and Decision Sciences from Indiana University, Bloomington. Dr. Schoenherr, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to LMU community out of your very busy schedule. I'd like to ask you first to present an overview or your own analysis of the global supply chain management then I'll ask you a few questions following your presentation before we have a Q&A session with the audience. Audience, please click on the questions button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to submit questions. At the end of the webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a brief survey. Dr. Schoenherr, thank you for your comprehension. Go ahead, please. Well, thank you so very much and uh, good evening, good afternoon and uh, good morning everyone and my sincere thanks, uh, first of all, Dean Smith and Professor Pike for the very kind uh, invitation to, to be speaking here tonight in your seminar series. It's, it's a true pleasure and, and honor, so thanks very much for, for that opportunity. Let me share my screen here. Um, the uh, thoughts and the comments that I have prepared for, for you this evening. Uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 pandemic on global supply chain management, current status and future prospects. 
these are some thoughts that uh, I and my colleagues have been collecting over the last few months. And I structured this uh, presentation this, this evening into three parts. First, a couple of thoughts, what led up to the crisis in supply chain management, why the supply chain hasn't been able to respond better to uh, these uh, truly unprecedented uh, incidents that we've been experiencing. And then the second part, the brief overview of what the impact has been on the supply chain and we all have experienced that firsthand when we went to the grocery stores. So a little bit of a, a broad perspective of what it meant in, in, in a on a global basis. And then lastly, the component that I'd like to focus on most is what did we learn from our experiences right now? What can we take into the future? How can we think, make things better in going forward? So the, the first um, uh, area I wanted to focus on the time before the pandemic. Why haven't companies been preparing more for such an instant? Why were there so many empty shelves that we experienced when we went to the grocery store? In my view, what the, 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 the true culprit of it all was that when you look at supply chain management, companies have been uh, neglecting or not really emphasizing the management component in supply chain management. But companies cannot be blamed. Uh, I mean, when you look at the last 10, 15 years, we were living in very stable and predictable environments. Yes, there were true significant disasters and, and tragedies. Um, human lives were lost, and I by no means want to diminish the, 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 the significant, the dramatic events that have been happening over the last uh, one or two decades, uh, just to name a few. Uh, the Japanese earthquake and subsequent tsunami, hurricanes Rita and Katrina, uh, floods in Thailand, um, uh, lots of natural catastrophes and they uh, unfortunately led to a loss of uh, a lot of uh, human life um, and significant disruptions to the supply chain. But when it com came, comes to the supply chain, most of these incidents were very isolated, they were specific and they were relatively easily overcome in the grand scheme of things. So that's why, why we, we, we probably didn't see companies focus too much on risk management and risk mitigation. We also saw that in the stock market. Uh, since the Great Recession 2008-2009, the stock market has been going up almost continuously uh, since then. Uh, so companies really cannot be blamed. They simply took advantage of the very stable business environment and probably not too many wanted to kind of realize or, or, or recognize that these good times can come to, to an end. Uh, so I think a lot of companies were caught off guard. They, they were feeling too comfortable. Uh, another element uh, that I think led to a lot of companies struggling right now is that during these comfortable times, a lot of emphasis was put on, put on cost. And again, companies cannot be blamed for it. Uh, look at um, uh, the, the global supply chains. They have been becoming much more intricate, much more complex. Companies increasingly focusing on just small parts of the overall value chain and these huge complex uh, supply networks uh, really uh, ran on uh, the, 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 the presumption that everything would work according to clock speed and that very little disruptions uh, would uh, happen. And if disruptions happened, they could be very easily overcome. Uh, so again, with the focus on cost, not a whole lot of companies uh, held, for example, backup inventory or had redundant supply chains, redundant shipping routes, for example, because that would not be cost efficient. Um, there has also been this push towards lean environments where you have close to zero inventory. So that was, again, uh, directly felt when we saw the empty shelves in, in the supermarkets because supply lines were cut off, inventories were repleted very quickly and there wasn't just any supply coming in. Um, so, so, so what we've been dealing with is, is really unpre unprecedented on this global scale. 
um, something that we haven't seen for, for a long time. But uh, these factors, in, in my view, uh, contributed a lot to uh, many companies having been caught off guard. In addition to this short-term focus that the most companies have, have been pursuing, because if you want to invest in risk mitigation and uh, risk management, that uh, is resource intensive. It costs money to build up uh, inventory, to build up warehouses, to store the inventory. Uh, the inventory might become obsolete. So and a lot of risks is associated with that as well. Um, so uh, companies uh, really were not prepared for what was happening. Another uh, bullet point that I didn't put here on the slide, but that also contributed why a lot of companies weren't able to respond quickly is us, consumers. Consumers have, been, have become so much more scrutinizing, so much more demanding. Uh, many of you have heard the mantra, faster, better, cheaper, in that we want new innovations, new additions of new products in a much shorter amount of time. Clock speeds are decreasing. We want the products to be cheaper and we want the products to be of superior quality. That also led companies to be very responsive and to have limited inventory on the supply chain because our likes and dislikes have been changing so dramatically. So companies were really responding to what they were seeing in us as, as the customers. So this in a nutshell, um, in my view, have been major contributors to uh, why companies were uh, not being able to respond um, better to this, to this pandemic. Now, um, what impact did the pandemic ha have uh, on supply chain management uh, across the globe? I show you here a few statistics. The next three slides show you a few statistics from a few select countries where the World Bank has been conducting surveys on the impact on uh, COVID-19 on businesses in those countries. Uh, you see a lot of um, white countries there. And that means that uh, no surveys have been conducted yet, but the World Bank is planning to conduct uh, a whole host of uh, surveys all across these countries. Uh, there's also no survey uh, for the US out yet uh, from, the, from the World Bank. But you see here just a, a tremendous impact uh, on the supply chain, the percentage of firms that experienced a decrease in supply of inputs. And I just highlighted here a, a few select countries, again, Russia, Mongolia, you see here Poland, Italy, uh, Morocco, Niger, Zambia, and, and Zimbabwe, were very, very traumatic impact on, on the supply chain, um, quite different uh, based on the countries. It also all depends on who they are serving, um, but it gives you um, a good picture of the dramatic impact on, on the supply chain all across the board. Another statistic here, the percentage of firms adjusting or converging their products or services. Uh, and again, this is a response now of uh, what comes next. What can we learn out of the current crisis? Um, Again, another factor that has led a lot of companies being so vulnerable right now that I didn't, didn't mention before is that too many companies have been specializing on, uh, on niche kind of offerings um, that, were, uh, that, were, that were kind of, and, and companies weren't really diversified in terms of the offerings. And this is what this statistic now shows you here from the World Bank, that companies are taking a step back and uh, recognizing that they cannot put all of their eggs in one basket, that uh, if one market or, or one kind of product kind of domain uh, becomes obsolete or is, is not needed anymore, what can I do differently? How can I uh, kind of diversify myself in terms of production um, uh, approaches, processes, or different types of products that I could, uh, that I could offer? Uh, to my customers so that they're not too dependent on any one customer out there so that they can diversify. Uh, some of that was already learned in the Great Recession uh, 12 years ago, 2008, 2009. We in fact also did some research at a time here in Michigan and we found that a lot of the uh, first and second tier suppliers to the automotive industry, they were stranded because they didn't diversify. They were dependent so much on automotive that they didn't have any way out. And uh, we all recall the big three, um, or at least the two of the big three, they declared um, um, a bankruptcy or bankruptcy protection 
and uh, that was felt even more so with uh, tier one and tier two suppliers, especially amongst small and medium sized companies. And that was a wake up call already back then for these uh, tier two and tier one automotive suppliers to diversify, to not only focus on, on the automotive industry, but also go into other industries in case one industry kind of falls apart or is, is in significant trouble. And I think this is what the statistics, uh, this st statistic also tells us here from uh, the World Bank. A last a statistic from the World Bank, um, significant um, impact on, on, on also business, uh, businesses going uh, into bankruptcy or failing, uh, filing for, for insolvency. Um, again, here you see um, various different the magnitudes of percentages, especially in Mongolia, almost 50%. Again, it depends who they surveyed, so I, I don't know how representative, representative that is amongst the entire business uh, community in those countries. But nevertheless, it gives us uh, a good picture. I mean, even 0.2% um, uh, in the case of Morocco, that is, that is more than what uh, we would like to see. Um, uh, but even these higher percentages, they're, they're really concerning of, uh, again, businesses not having too much backup not, or not to have, having uh, many kind of financial resources to, to weather this, this, this crisis. How supply management has been reacting in that regard. Here I'm sharing you with some statistics uh, from CAPS Research out of, um, out of um, uh, Arizona, or Tempe, Arizona. They conducted some surveys right when the pandemic was really becoming prevalent on what uh, companies have been doing to kind of um, uh, stop the, uh, the bleeding, uh, so to say, to, for, so for the short term uh, kind of response, uh, a lot of them focused on shifting to alternate resources, increasing inventory. So again, issues that, that companies neglected uh, prior to the crisis because that cost money. Holding inventory costs money. Looking for alternate resources, uh, sources or dual sourcing, triple sourcing, that was much less efficient. That cost more money. So companies focus too much on cost, too little on risk. And now we are seeing through these statistics that a rethinking has, has started uh, and companies uh, trying to learn and, and trying to make it better moving forward. And that's the statistic that I wanted to share with you before kind of moving on to uh, what can we learn and how can we make it better going forward. Um, this is a survey conducted by the NDIA surveying especially small and medium-sized uh, enterprises, suppliers to the Department of Defense. Um, they surveyed about 700 uh, suppliers uh, right uh, when, um, when the uh, challenges started to emerge from, uh, I think, mid-March to early April. And they asked them a range of questions and one set of questions dealt with the impact that these SMEs, these small and medium-sized enterprises were experiencing. And they asked these questions on a scale from, from one to five, with five being most significantly impacted. And you see here a huge impact on the bottom line in terms of revenue, in terms of kind of businesses kind of not being able to sell anymore. Um, may that be because they themselves didn't have the input materials or customer demand was just not there anymore. I mean, people uh, were quarantining and um, they, they couldn't uh, get out and, and consume, especially in the, in the um, restaurant industry and uh, travel and hotel industry. Uh, but then also the ability to secure access to financial capital to kind of um, bridge th these difficult times and uh, with hope that it would kind of um, uh, tick up again. Uh, the ability to perform to contract, again, maybe because they weren't able to get the needed input materials themselves from other suppliers. The ability, availability of a sufficient and qualified workforce, uh, since uh, people were um, uh, staying at home and quarantining at, as well. Uh, safe and secure facilities uh, in terms of um, uh, ensuring social distancing. The ability to get access to key officers in the DOD to provide guidance and maybe help. Um, and uh, then the, the remaining ones, uh, they weren't felt as too severely kind of being impacted by the, the, the pandemic, um, the confidence in the supply chain partners and material cost and availability 
um, they were kind of one of the, the lowest uh, kind of impacts felt uh, from the pandemic. But here, that picture or that statistic uh, illustrates again the vulnerability of especially SMEs, small and medium sized enterprises, uh, because they cannot fall back to uh, the capital reserves that maybe a larger company might have. They might not be as diversified as larger companies. Um, so they have uh, in particularly uh, hard hit during the pandemic. Now, what can we do differently? What have we learned? How do we move forward? And I structured that into three major themes. Uh, the first one, again, tying back to how I started, putting really the management in supply chain management again, specifically focusing on your suppliers through SRM, through supplier relationship management. What that means is that you care about your suppliers. It means that you look for the long-term health of your suppliers and provide them proactive help and assistance with uh, whatever they are needing. Uh, we are seeing that um, uh, to a great extent displayed uh, during the crisis right now, and we see parallels to our research that we did 12 years ago in the Great Recession. Here, it really depended on whether companies in the supply chain had a great relationship, whether they had built trust and commitment over many years. And if that was in place, they didn't leave each other stranded. Uh, they helped each other out um, in the hopes that uh, they would uh, help each other's, uh, contribute to each other's survival during that crisis. For example, uh, a buyer they might have paid a supplier much earlier than needed, or maybe even paid ahead of time before they, they even delivered the products. Vice versa, a supplier might have extended the payment terms if they saw the buyer was struggling. These acts of goodwill, they, uh, they, um, they were the outcome of oftentimes year-long development and nurturing of these relationships. And this is where truly relationships mattered because people and companies help each other out. You also saw, however, the, the other side around, the, the flip side in, in the Great Recession in that, uh, in that where there was no great relationship, where big, powerful buying companies didn't care about smaller suppliers and where suppliers asked for maybe financial assistance or earlier payment that the big buyer just refused to do so because they were just out for their own benefit. But if these small suppliers were able to survive, they remembered. And once uh, they were kind of over the, the crisis, those suppliers, small and medium sized suppliers, they refused to collaborate with these larger buyers again because, because they, that really hurt their, their feelings. I mean, there are people behind uh, companies as well. And uh, I mean, companies don't conduct business with companies. It's, it's people uh, behind uh, these, uh, these companies. Uh, so relationships really do matter. Uh, what that might mean, however, is that we might have to adjust our scorecards internally because too often purchasing agents are evaluated based on how much did you save me this year? And it doesn't really leave a lot of uh, leeway for maybe granting the supplier a little bit more kind of revenue uh, in the hopes that that might uh, kind of nurture the relationship a little bit more. The, not too much is taken in, into account uh, when it comes to, uh, of that nature is taken into account when evaluating the, the buyer's performance on a yearly basis. So we might have to rethink of uh, how we are evaluating people internally, purchasing managers in particularly, as well as salespeople on the supplier side uh, in order to kind of nurture that uh, relationship a little bit. And we're seeing that already uh, being done uh, right now in some companies is that buyers, while they certainly have a savings target per year, they don't have to achieve that for every single supplier, for every single category, if they can substantiate why they're not achieving that savings target. Maybe they wanted to help the supplier out. Maybe it was in the own interest of the buying company itself, because if they didn't help the supplier out, the supplier might have gone out of business and the buyer would have had to look for a new supplier. And that might have not been easy undertaking. So maybe sacrificing a little bit on the savings 
helped the buyer so much more in the long run as well. So what companies really need to be doing, they take to, they, they need to take a different approach to how they're managing suppliers. They, they, they need to view them as an extension of their company and they need to try to earn preferential treatment. They, try to, they need to try to become a customer of choice. And what that means is building trust, building commitment, building that relationship potential. So that if capacity is constrained on the supply side and suppliers need to pick and choose to whom they deliver first, that you are the company that gets first dips on that delivery, on that scarce capacity. And this is what we've been seeing here in, in the crisis and the pandemic as well. Um, we all saw that in the supermarket, uh, supermarkets as well, that the, the, the stores didn't get the deliveries that they needed. Uh, and those stores, I would assume, got the deliveries first that had great relationships with uh, the supplier in place. Because if a supplier had to make the choice, they certainly deliver to those uh, customers that treated them well in the past that earned this preferential treatment that became a customer of choice. And again, that cannot be achieved overnight. Uh, it takes uh, years, some many years to, to develop that. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and I think this is a wake up call for companies to start thinking much more about that. And, um, and, and uh, for example, in the form of supply advisory councils, this is a very neat approach where you select a a, a group, a small group of suppliers, maybe a dozen or so um, representative suppliers out of your supply base and hold quarterly meetings with them where you really get down to business and ask them, how can it do a better job? What uh, frustrates you about me? Uh, this really um, kind of puts the onus on the supplier to be open and honest what the buyer can do better in the relationships. How can the buyer make the life of the supplier easier? And it can be very little things, uh, but if the buyer doesn't know anything about it, then they're not gonna do it. So these uh, supplier advisory councils can be very powerful uh, instruments to, 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 um, to, to really nurture the relationship and find out what the supplier is, is really concerned about, developing these relationships, earning preferential treatment. Because we need to remember, and this pandemic has demonstrated very vividly, that we are living in an integrated world. We need to be looking out for the long-term success of our suppliers as well. And we need to develop strategies that recognize uh, these suppliers as being um, uh, valuable participants in, in the overall kind of um, supply chain network that uh, we are integrated in. Now, the second um, aspect um, uh, that I wanted to focus on is risk management and the importance to create a risk management culture, so-called risk management culture. Now, this culture doesn't mean that risks are taken lightly. Um, it, however, means that companies recognize that risks are part and parcel of doing business. If you take high risks, you can expect high rewards, but also uh, miserable failures. And uh, recognizing this, that risks are just part of doing business, this needs to be ingrained, especially in supply managers, in that they think about risk in everything that they're doing. That risk management is not a separate task or a separate function that is uh, in a company, but that risk management should always be on the minds of uh, purchasing professional and virtually everyone in the company and uh, thinking about what if, how can I mitigate uh, the risks should they manifest. So companies should be, should be thinking about that constantly measuring, managing their suppliers and focusing not only on the first tier suppliers, but thinking about entire system wide risks. Uh, because your first tier supplier might be perfectly fine, but they might be dependent on a whole host of uh, higher tier suppliers and it just needs one of them to fail and you, uh, you, you won't have uh, the product. So companies need to rethink their supply chain design um, in terms of building in redundancies, building in uh, redundant supply chain, alternate uh, shipping routes in case um, uh, certain ports are impacted by 
by a natural uh, disaster or, or, or strikes or anything that might happen. So uh, thinking about that ahead of time and developing contingency plans that is of paramount importance. And really the, the foundation for all of that is uh, risk uh, communication uh, and the collaboration, information sharing across the supply chain within the company, but especially also across the supply chain so that everyone is, is on board and, uh, and knows what is, is, what is going on. Um, in, the, in the interest of time, let me jump uh, to my, my last uh, um, kind of dimension that I wanted to, to emphasize here in terms of the strategies going forward, uh, globalization. Um, globalization um, ha has also contributed to uh, supply chain become supply chains becoming overly complex. It has strengthened supply chains uh, tremendously because you could uh, really kind of pick and choose uh, best uh, partners all across the world. Uh, but we are now seeing with, uh, with uh, the, simply the geographical distance to our overseas partners has created real challenges uh, with uh, imports and, and exports. So there has been this call uh, issued to reconsider the focus on outsourcing and offshoring of bringing production back home to domestically um, of uh, right shoring of geographical diversification there, there have been these discussions and um, I think there's not a one size fits all solution. Uh, will all kind of business now come back? Uh, certainly not. Uh, I think um, what is needed is uh, kind of um, a rethinking of what makes sense, kind of a, a, a multi-pronged approach of, um, of, of, of uh, not thinking of uh, kind of uh, either or, but how can we combine, how can we uh, develop a resilient and robust supply chains uh, so that um, we are more resilient uh, to uh, whatever uh, kind of crisis uh, we might be in next. And then just a few concluding thoughts. Um, these crises, uh, especially this crisis right now, but uh, especially other crises in the past, uh, they, they serve as wake up calls. Uh, to companies. Um, again, with these uh, kind of very good years, uh, almost uh, more, than a, more than a decade, 12, uh, 13 years of good years, um, maybe companies have become complacent. Um, again, they cannot be blamed for it because uh, why not take advantage of a good business environment, but maybe uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit companies maybe they're becoming a little bit too relaxed. Um, and um, not really, um, they are not really too vigilant that uh, that something like of this magnitude uh, could happen. But uh, just a few final thoughts that in terms of crisis, these system choke points are revealed, serving as reminders for the importance of certain topics such as management, supply chain management, supply relationship management, risk management, as well as um, kind of being cautious or. Uh, pursuing a, a more kind of um, um, more thoughtful approach to, to globalization and um, prices like these should uh, direct our efforts to, to focus on, on, on what is truly, truly important. But with that, um, that is all that I had prepared and uh, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Schoenner, uh, for your comprehensive and insightful analysis of pre-pandemic situation and future prospects of global supply chain management. I'd like to ask a few questions before we entertain the questions from the audience. Uh, so here goes my first question. Uh, your presentation reminds me that one of the key challenges for companies in managing the global supply chain is how to strike a balance between efficiency as you mentioned, low cost and resilience. To increase resi uh, e efficiency, companies probably want to deal with a smaller number of suppliers with low inventory, like the just-in-time system. However, the COVID pandemic has shifted the pendulum towards resilience, as you talked about uh, the risk management, which suggests the diversification of suppliers and increased inventory. You emphasize the quality of relationship, maybe over the sheer number of suppliers. We all know the Japanese are uh, very famous for their symbiotic relationship with suppliers. 
In terms of risk management, are you suggesting the companies would be better off by building deeper and more integrative relationships with a few suppliers rather than diversifying their suppliers with an arm's length relationship? That's a, thank you very much. That's a, that's a great question. I, I think uh, companies uh, need to consider um, all of these. Um, uh, first of all, uh, there's uh, not a one size fits all solution. Um, and uh, I think uh, what uh, companies need to really do is to take a step back and uh, look at their, their, their source, look at their supply chain and look at what products are truly critical to their operations, to the final customer, to their ability to deliver the final product and then classify and categorize the products into different categories. And then based on these categories, they can develop appropriate strategies. May that be an emphasis on cost or may that be an emphasis on uh, resilience and, and, and responsiveness. So it all comes down to finding the right fit. And it doesn't mean that one company has to decide uh, on one versus the other on great relationships or, or cost efficiencies. I think a company can decide based on product category. So for a very integral part of your component that is maybe leading the company to differentiate the product in the marketplace, here it would be very well advised for companies to develop deeper relationships versus for other types of products, your nuts and bolts, then certainly that uh, would, um, relationships would be good in any instance, but um, we, we simply don't have enough resources uh, and, and, and time and, and, and uh, kind of um, human resources to, to develop great relationships with, with every single supplier. So here in, in these instances, the emphasis could st still be on cost and efficiency and for, for other uh, sources, it, it might be best to, um, to, to focus on, on relationships. And uh, we are seeing that, that companies are asking themselves the question, and not only companies, but also uh, governmental um, uh, bodies and, and uh, lawmakers. Uh, we've been engaging in discussions with them as well, where they uh, want to identify, for example, the truly critical supply chains for our nation of um, what uh, are these supply chains in the first place. Um, we've seen that uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, supply chains, especially for PPE, uh, hand sanitizers and the like, and then um, kind of scoping out these supply chains and trying to make them more robust, building the capacity here domestically, and, and certainly developing the relationships with suppliers, but for, for, other, for other types of items, um, um, that might not be the best approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, my second question is about the uh, reshoring or the, you know, reshoring. That's a quite interesting term they use. As you highlight in your data, uh, many experts actually predicted at the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic that severe disruption or even meltdown of global supply chain will make companies bring more work home, so-called reshoring. Even before the pandemic, we've seen the trend in increase in reshoring or nearshoring. However, systematic risks such as those which brought the collapse of banking industry during the 2008 global financial crisis have not materialized. Therefore, contrary to expectation of many experts, companies imperative to reshore their supply chain has declined as widespread disruptions in goods supplies has not happened. So I'm not really sure who's telling the truth it seems like there's a conflicting sort of what uh, uh, the uh, two different side, how to view this impact of the pandemic or global supply chain. So I'm just curious that uh, what is your own take on this particular issue? Well, uh, the term reshoring has been discussed for many, many years now, a little bit over a decade. And uh, in, in my view, while there are certainly a lot of great use cases of companies having reshored and brought production back home domestically, uh, I, think, um, I think the expectations were not met. I think expectations were very high of uh, creating um, thousands of jobs and 
certainly a, a lot of jobs were created, but probably not in the magnitude that um, a lot of people were expecting when they read a lot of these um, publications in, in the popular press, uh, both now as well as uh, 10 or 15 years ago when that um, term uh, really uh, emerged first. Um, so I, I think um, it's, it's always quick to, um, to say a quick fix would be to reshore, uh, and that would be great. Um, but there is a whole lot that goes into that in, in first of all, um, developing the capabilities, developing the capacity, having access to, uh, to well-trained workers, and that cannot be done overnight. And uh, over the long term, um, that might um, that might not uh, not be feasible as well. Uh, so I think that that's why we kind of introduced the term the term right shoring here. Um, that uh, that you you it needs to be right. It uh, you cannot just uh, have an instant uh, reflex and just bring it back. But you need to think it through. Does it make sense from the long term? And it's it's also not an either or decision. Uh, I think this is also what a lot of companies uh, haven't really kind of um, realized is that uh, you can certainly um, uh, bring back production in, in a certain degree here domestically and then with another supply chain for the same items still source globally. Uh, so this multi-pronged approach again, while not cost efficient necessarily, you kind of get the best of both worlds. So you still have maybe the low cost advantage from sourcing overseas but then you also have a backup here domestically with the domestic suppliers. And maybe even a third approach might be to internalize some of that capability in-house and building your own kind of emergency production capacity in-house as well. So, so I think um, these discussions are, are great, kind of the reshoring discussions in that they, they, they motivate for companies to, to bring back jobs. And that is uh, definitely uh, very welcome here. Um, um, but I think um, companies need to, to view it as kind of a, a multi-pronged approach and not like an either or decision. I think that uh, for, from a long-term perspective, I think that um, that would be most suitable, suitable for most companies. Okay, so I'm going to just cut my questions here, although I prepared a few more questions, but it looks like that the audience has a lot of interesting questions. So thank you so much. And we have about roughly 16 minutes left for Q&A session with the audience. So at this point, I'd like to ask that the uh, Cyber Program Management Director, Dr. Marty Jones, would you please read the questions received from the audience? Absolutely. Um, yes, the first question we have is, has the pandemic driven innovation in any industries more than others? Well, um, innovation uh, certainly, like in, in, in terms of uh, restructuring uh, production facilities, like we saw that in the automotive industry here with uh, General Motors in the Detroit area and their ability to rapidly switch to, um, to making uh, ventilators in a very short amount of time in collaboration with, uh, with other companies as well. Um, and um, and, and uh, also companies, as we saw from the statistics with um, the World Bank, um, I think um, that is also indicative of companies being more creative, being more innovative of what other products uh, they can be offering. Um, a lot of uh, small businesses, uh, they are stranded um, because they were shut down and they created innovative ways to deliver their services virtually. Um, so, so, so in that regard, I think it has definitely been a huge push to drive innovation on, on various fronts, uh, both in terms of uh, service and product delivery, but then also in, in terms of product innovation. Thank you. Uh, there's another question related to this. Is there one industry in particular that has innovated the most at this time? Well, um, here in Detroit, we are a little bit biased because we have uh, the big three in, in our backyard. Um, so I would say automotive, um, like in, in most instances, is oftentimes the, the front runner um, when it comes to, to innovations. Um, but again, my, my view might be a little bit biased um, based on where, where I'm located. Um, but I would say, yeah, automotive and um, uh, obviously pharma with uh, their, their quest to, to find a cure I think um, um, they are certainly not to be neglected as well in any case in, at all. Thank you. 
Um, Thomas says, I work for a small business. Some of my customers canceled several purchase orders a week before shipping due to COVID. My supplier is currently holding inventories for us. Do you have a suggestion on how to convince the customer that they are responsible to take these goods? Well, um, it, uh, it really, I think, um, depends on, on, on the type of good that, that you're selling and, uh, again, the relationship that uh, you have with, uh, with the customer. I mean, um, you could um, convince the customer, you know, a lot of small businesses in, in, in the town where I live and they, they have um, kind of emphasized that uh, these small businesses, they are part of the community. Uh, and kind of hoping for community support in, in that regard. Uh, so emphasizing um, the, the, the size characteristic, I think that might be an approach. And um, then, um, yeah, uh, kind of alerting them to their, to them placing the order um, in, in the first place that um, kind of they, they should um, feel, take responsibility for having placed the order in, in the first place and, um, and, and, and take the order, pay for the order. Great suggestions. Another attendee has asked, how can a small business who is already vulnerable without this crisis navigate the new economy, even if they're their own suppliers, vertically integrated? Well, small businesses are, are definitely very much uh, hard hit. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, developing relationships with suppliers, but if they're vertically integrated, uh, which I assume means that there may be kind of um, disintermediating that they are kind of competing against the small business um, that is be, being a challenge. But I think what um, kind of goes back to some of the World Bank statistics is um, maybe diversifying, uh, making the, the product, uh, differentiating the, the product in, in some uh, other way um, in terms of uh, service delivery and in, in terms of new programs, um, you know, not knowing about what the the product is that it is being sold. Um, I think just maybe thinking outside of the box uh, and providing additional value propositions for, for consumers um, to, uh, to, to just put another kind of plus point on, on, on the list of making the product more attractive. Okay. We have another question about, uh, from Tom. Do, you, do European firms face different challenges and opportunities in supply chain than their American counterparts? All across the board, I don't think they are, they're facing more um, or, or less challenges than, than here. Um, there might be differences in terms of um, support from, from the government level. Um, in, in general, um, my, my kind of perception is that um, there's a lot more uh, support across the board in, in European countries simply because of um, the different uh, structure of, of, of the government. Um, but all across the board, I don't see them in any way less impacted or more impacted than, than businesses here uh, because uh, businesses in, in both, uh, in, in all countries are reliant on the same supply chains. So uh, everyone is on in the same boat. The only difference that um, I, I might, uh, I might uh, kind of see is the level of uh, kind of government support in, in various ways in different aspects. Okay, thank you. And um, the next question is, how do you recommend companies devise effective risk management plans while also remaining cost efficient? Well, this is, uh, this is a fine line um, in terms of how much risk do you want to expose yourself. And um, if uh, you're not investing in risk management, um, that is money saved. Uh, and um, and that's, so, it's, so, it's, so, it's a, so it's a trade-off. Um, it's a trade-off. It go, comes back, I think, to the to the philosophy of the owner of the company, of uh, the board of directors, of how much risks they want to expose themselves to and what they want to do in, in risk management. But what I mentioned about risk management pertaining to kind of supplier relationship management, this is not really that you need to invest a whole lot of resources in, um, in that, uh, again, what I mentioned is that risk management should be um, ingrained in everyone's action day in and day out. 
So it doesn't really need to be a huge investment, um, just maybe an upfront training uh, session on different tools and approaches of the contingency plans, scenario analyses, and then just uh, honing people's skills, making them aware of uh, different risks that might manifest themselves and uh, keeping that in, in the mind of everyone. I think um, that would be a kind of a very kind of low cost investment in, in risk management. And then you can go all out in, in terms of purchasing risk management software, subscribing to news feeds about the alerts that, that are going on uh, across the world. Um, but I think uh, ingraining it in, in everyone's um, behavior, I think that's the, the first step. And the next question is, how do you see companies recovering from the pandemic? Do you believe select supply chains will be able to manage and return demand when things return to a normal and people are able to be out again and more open? Are some companies focusing on building their inventory in anticipation for things returning to normal? Um, a, a few companies are, are already thinking about that. There was another survey that I came across just recently that, um, uh, and that found that maybe 15%, 20% of companies are already thinking about uh, the, the post-pandemic strategy and uh, how to go forward. So companies are actively uh, planning about that. And um, I have no doubt that uh, supply chains will kind of um, get up on their feet again and uh, be able to kind of deliver the products that we need on a daily basis. And uh, uh, hopefully uh, that all kind of ends soon with uh, the development of, of a vaccine and, and um, life can get back to normal. But we're already seeing that uh, supply chains uh, are starting to, to come back. I mean, we are seeing um, no empty shelves hardly anymore in, in the stores. Uh, that was very kind of short-lived, that, that experience. Uh, so I think supply chains have uh, adapted and are adapting quite rapidly. Great. Uh, we have two more questions. Uh, well, maybe a couple more. Um, th is there any hope for a meaningful and lasting reshoring without the extension of China tariffs? And if Vice President or Vice President Biden takes the White House, should they continue the level of tariffs on Chinese goods to encourage American production? Well, I think with, uh, with uh, reshoring, um, what, uh, what, what I foresee is that um, it will, I don't think it will uh, kind of um, increase too much uh, based on what we've been already seeing. I mean, reshoring has been happening all, all along. Uh, and this might have been another push to, to rethink companies uh, to reshore um, and maybe to uh, diversify their global footprint uh, in terms of where they source from. Um, and if one country becomes less attractive, um, maybe go to other more attractive countries, um, even before uh, the, uh, the tariff uh, and the trade wars uh, We've seen companies uh, moving away from China because wages were increasing there quite uh, quite a bit as well uh, to other lower cost countries like Indonesia and Malaysia and even Africa. So uh, I don't think it's an either or uh, approach. And um, if uh, companies move out of China, that they're coming back to the US, I don't think that's that's a given. I mean, there are other low cost country locations there. There are under other kind of um, more higher cost uh, locations as well. Um, so I think it's, it's um, a very kind of dynamic environment and um, while certainly a lot of um, jobs will come back, with, which I hope, um, I think there will, companies will also become creative um, because, um, again, what I mentioned before, um, we cannot just bring production back here. Uh, there might not be the production facility, there might not be the capacity, there might not be the, the, the employees uh, that would be um, doing the, these works. Um, and um, uh, simply the, uh, some of the raw materials, um, they, they are simply located. A lot of the, the earth's uh, rare earth minerals, 80% um, of the exotic minerals are located in, in China. So simply because of that, um, there might be still a, a big dependence on, on China also because of that. And also because of the, uh, the manufacturing um, kind of um, capacity and the um, quite sophisticated manufacturing um, kind of layouts and plans that have been developing over the years. So, so I think um, 
sourcing from China will not, not go away. Uh, like I said before, it might be kind of a multi-pronged approach, part from China, part domestically, maybe part in-house, part from Mexico. Um, so I think companies will uh, need to get creative. Uh, again, it will cost more, but again, that might be a way to mitigate some of that risk that you're not kind of dependent on one supply chain only, uh, so that you're kind of multi, uh, multi pursuing a multi-pronged approach. Okay. The next question is from Jen. She says, if lean inventory is traditional for the sake of cost efficiency, how do you propose companies straddle this line? How best to react? Does a plan of total change need to be implemented? or an in-case-of-emergency plan handy to put in place if need be? Well, I think, I think here it would, again, depend on, on the context, how discerning the customers are, what the product is, how quickly it, it can be ramped up. It's uh, always good to have some inventory backup in place, some, some inventory buffer. Um, and this is also what we're seeing in these statistics that company are increasingly uh, doing that. Um, here we at Michigan State, for example, have also been uh, kind of holding more inventory uh, than, than usual. Um, again, cost more money, but kind of, we have to weigh kind of uh, the risk of not having that inventory. Um, and I think um, what companies need to, uh, to uh, uh, how companies maybe can help think about risk uh, in uh, a more kind of granular fashion is to think about what would the impact be on my revenue if I did not get that material or that input uh, material. It could be a small bolt that costs 10 cents, but if I don't have that bolt, I cannot sell my thousand dollar product. So what if the supplier of the 10 cent bolt fails to deliver and I cannot replace it for whatever reason? what would be my impact, a thousand dollars for, for 10 cents. So I think companies need to kind of think about these in, in more kind of granular terms and think about the impact, the, the exposure, the revenue impact, um, and then decide what makes most sense. Does it make sense to hold a lot of inventory? Does it make sense to, um, to do a source um, when, when looking at uh, that impact, that uh, kind of uh, revenue exposure? Okay, thank you. We'll take just two last questions. Hi, Tobias. Great insights and presentation. Do you believe that companies will be forced to change from using the good old SWOT analysis to a hybrid model of SWOT analysis and value chain analysis? I think SWOT analysis will always be around. It's, it's a great tool. In fact, I used it this morning in one of my classes, one of my MBA classes. Uh, so I think that will always be around. But all of these frameworks, um, they cannot make the decision for you. I always emphasize they are great tools to structure the information, to put, it, put, them, put the information into buckets. Um, but then it's in the end the decision maker, you that makes the decisions and uh, no framework, no kind of a computer program, no insight can uh, take that over from you. I, uh, this is where the human intuition, the human instinct come, comes in. So I think these frameworks will be around uh, forever because they provide structure and they um, allow us to comprehend reality in its complexity and based on that uh, however then it's your task to make the decision based on that structured information wonderful thank you dr Sherwood. we have one last question when systems are disrupted they usually do not return to a former state so what might be the characteristics of supply chains in a new normal any key changes to be expected in supply chain design or behavior? Um, again, there's this multi-pronged approach that uh, you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket, but that you're pursuing different supply chains. Again, sourcing 50% capacity from, from Asia, from China, uh, maybe 25% from Mexico, and then 25% uh, domestically. Um, so I think uh, companies need to um, kind of uh, move back the pendulum um, a little bit. I mean, uh, there, there's no right uh, kind of perfect way because the environment is so dynamic. Um, uh, 20 years ago, we saw companies having thousands of, uh, thousands of different suppli suppliers, very complex supply chains. They moved towards lean, they moved move towards supply-based rationalization. Very few suppliers that worked well for a number of years, but now we are seeing that's, that's also not the right answer. So now I think companies are moving back a little bit, relaxing these uh, constraints a little bit, 
having more suppliers, having uh, kind of dual supply chains, redundant supply chains, um, having backup plans in, in place. And um, yeah, and that seems to me um, the best solution right now, but I can imagine uh, there will be modifications to that as well as we move forward. So I think um, important for companies is that um, to, to recognize that the design that suits best right now um, needs to be reviewed and updated based on uh, the evolving environment. And, um, and uh, I think, again, too many companies probably, uh, again, forgot about that in, in, the, early, uh, in, the, in the last 10 years. Um, and that's why maybe they, they weren't better prepared. Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I'm very sorry that we are not able to get to all the questions. Dr. Schwerner, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and insights with us about this timely and important topic today. I also would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I know that uh, there are my colleagues and then even my professors and then alumni and also the business practitioners and parents. Um, so we really, really appreciate it, uh, joining this uh, webinar tonight. I hope that uh, you have enjoyed the program and we'll be back with another program, Global Talent Management Conference in November. So please stay safe and healthy until then.